I, so I just started recording it so we can transcribe as well. Cool, cool. Um, and maybe I'll spin up a HackMD. Um, just trying to connect my computer here. Um, um, but yeah, basically, I want to make sure that first we have a good understanding of what um, what the problems are, like what what are the issues that we're actually trying to solve here, and like what can go wrong. Um, because I think that that's that's maybe like the first kind of starting point, like um, you know, seeing the potential problems, and there's there's different potential problems for different types of users. Um, so there's, you know, I I kind of group the users into three classes, like um, app developers, module developers, and client developers. Um, so that's I think that's a good starting point. I also want to kind of set a goal, and and I think the goal should be. Um, that like, you know, we have, you know, more people than just one or two people have a good grasp of what the problem is and what some of the potential solutions are. Uh, and then we can come to some, you know, agreements on, you know, what is what is the solution we're going to take and and the and the trade offs of that solution, um, given the different options and and you know their complexity. Um, so how does that sound as a framing for how we start? Anybody have any? Amendments to that. Sound good? Okay. Um, so I'm yeah, I'm having trouble getting my computer. Uh, it looks like my computer actually has crashed, and so I'm like, I don't have my computer available right now. Um, I wonder if somebody else could just. Start up a hack MD. Sure. I mean, uh, thanks, Julian. All right. So maybe before I start kind of going into like what the, um, like my own description of what the problems are, it might be good to just check around the group and see like, what level of kind of understanding people have of like what ADR54 is trying to deal with and, um, you know, not just ADR54, but what are some of the potential problems with um, versioning and protobuf files that we um, are running into or could run into with the SDK, just so that I kind of get it, just get a, a sense of like where everybody's like coming into this from. Does that, people willing to kind of just do a little share as to where they, where they're seeing things to start. Yes, no. Maybe you can yeah. share your way, I guess. I was just saying, uh, we could also just kind of jump in. I mean, you know, we'll probably, that'll probably kind of come out. Uh, in in discussion, okay. If we're okay with that, okay. Um, cool. All right. So we were having a discussion on this the other day, and and that was in particular in relationship to. Um, okay, I'm just trying to think about where to start because it's a little bit um, complex, but all right. You know, we've split up the SDK into, we started splitting the SDK up into different goal modules based on um, the the logical separation of SD, of what were called SDK modules um, before, and, and they're still called SDK modules, but we've started kind of making that boundary also a Go module boundary. And in, and in order to make that possible, we've needed to figure out a way to break um, cyclic dependencies between different modules. That's that's like one thing that we're already kind of confronted with. Another thing that we were confronted with that led to us um, spinning out this API module as it currently stands uh, was just how to how to expose some protobuf types to clients so that clients can interact with Cosmos SDK chains without needing to depend on a specific version of the SDK. Um, Cause that turned out to be pretty problematic for some clients. Um, and so that's like, like 
that was the first reason for spinning out the API modules just for client support. Um, and I wish Freddy was here, but he was he was pretty involved in that in that decision, and he was the one that originally kind of suggested that approach of spinning out the API module um, based on some practices that were done in um, I forget which projects, but I think even Kubernetes does something like that, where they have like a separate API module, and then their like implementations live in different Go modules. So it's a pattern that already existed in in, in the Go ecosystem in um, relationship to Protobuf before we started trying to use it. Um, so like the most immediate thing that I'm bringing up on, um, that, that I brought up on Monday was uh, like when you're, like now that we're we're splitting up the SDK into different Go modules, um, we still have this monolithic API module, and there's difficulty with versioning that. Um, that's like one one sort of aspect of of the problem, and that that's like a problem I think both for like for client developers and and other modules that are are kind of depending on on a module that's depending on another module. Um, so that's like one dimension of of the issue. The other dimension is for a module itself. Um, once we start actually using uh, the proto reflect types more in our modules, we're, we're using them, you know, in some cases a little bit in some of the modules, but not super heavily. But the idea is eventually we'll be able to use those proto um, reflect types instead of GoGo prototypes. Um, we have them generated in the API module, which lives outside of the like the state machine module itself. Um, and there's different potential problems that can arise there related to both like the drift of the minor version and how you deal with semantic versioning. Um, so that's kind of like the scope of what we're trying to deal with here. Um, I'm not exactly sure where, where in this kind of like, where's maybe the, well, actually maybe the best place to start is, is just dealing with our immediate like issue of like, how do we tag, um, like the API module in reference, how do we tag different Go modules in reference to like each other and in particular the API module? Um, so yeah, maybe we can pick up that conversation from Monday. Does anyone have... mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess it'd be good to kind of identify like, I guess concretely what the problems with the current system are and like as far as tagging, so if I if I'm break if I break out a module and I tag against the monolithic API, like what like what about that is problematic? So the thing that's problematic about about this, and it you know we talked about it some on Monday, but it seemed like we didn't all get to like a shared understanding. Um, if you have if you have two separate Go modules that are both depending on API, say you have bank and staking, and so and they're both being developed on main, and so. Let's say that that. Um, when, that hmm? What do you mean by developed on main? I mean, you just mean we don't develop on main. We make PRs to main. We make PRs to main. Yes, which means that like main is basically where like we're we're not doing we're doing um, a a workflow called trunk based development as opposed to Git flow. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I I know trunk based is just you can you don't have to explain trunk based to me so. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to, to 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 call out that because like there could be an alternative where we were doing Git flow and then we'd have different, a slightly different workflow. But given how we're you know doing things, all PRs are onto main. We don't do PRs onto feature branches and then merge those feature branches back into main. So if I'm making, let's say for instance, I'm making an update to the bank module and I'm 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 adding. Um, maybe like a new message to the the bank module. And I go and I I add that to the protofiles, I generate the protofiles, and now those protofiles get generated in API. And now I'll go tag the API module as something um, and I want to consume it from bank. Um, but at the current moment when I'm as soon as I'm consuming it to bank, like I'm not, you know, I haven't released the bank state machine. I'm not I'm not necessarily calling those new types that I've added to the API module as released, as in production. I'm just, I've just generated them so that I can so that I can tag API and I can consume it in my bank module, which is a separate Go module. Um, 
so there's first the question of like what what tag do I actually put on API, assuming that API is consumed in production by some um, clients? Like, do I give it a maybe I give it like a beta tag or an alpha tag? I say, all right, it's yeah. alpha. One. Can, can we? So I think for me the confusion is what do you what exactly is it do you mean by in development? Because that's kind of a long phase of the SDLC that, that to me means when I'm actively working. But I think to you it sort of means uh, it, it's kind of bleeding into to making releases, or, or maybe this has to do with um, how we do testing. I'm not sure. Well, well, like, to, to, to me, if it's like if I'm in development, I can just use a go work and I don't need to make any releases on the API module. And then maybe, and then, you know, so if, if my changes include um, kind of like what, how I'm doing now, like I need to update the proto files. Um, so I've split that into another PR. So that PR goes up first. There's some discussion and hopefully we come to consensus around it. And then a release is made. And then I can make my, you know, my bank PR. Like, I kind of have the same issue as before that, right? Mm -hmm. Sorry, Julian, we go. I think the issue is like when you have, when you're still developing OS on main, it's begin merge, and you have bank change already ready, and then you have like half work on OS that is not ready. Uh, and if when you want to take ABI, then you have the API module includes those change on OS already. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think it's like, I think it's like this is this is pretty straightforward that that's an unworkable situation. I think we just need to like understand why that's like just kind of talk through like the implications of like why it's unworkable. I still don't understand what's unworkable here. I'm okay. sorry. I'm sorry. I feel I feel like I'm crazy for not understanding, but like I it's just, okay. it's I just don't. We'll talk through. We'll talk through. So okay, yeah, no, it, no, and it's good, and that's what I'm saying. Like I want to make sure we're all like having the same like view on the problem. So like. Yeah, I mean, you could use a go work, but like the, the the reality is, is that like if we're doing PRs on the main, you've already merged the proto file changes into the API module. Um, no, I, and, I mean, I, but when I'm working, I haven't. When I'm yeah, working but, locally, but, I but haven't. We don't, we don't do that sort of workflow. Like the, we do multiple, we do separate PRs. Like you're even doing it with the work, the stuff you're doing with proto, like the. Um, yeah, and what's, and what's, and what's wrong with that? Right. So like you're, you're going to, you're going to, we're going to, once we merge that, they're living in the API module on main. Yep. And when I want to, when you want to consume them from the SDK, you're going to need to tag the API module. So minor release, or or not from the SDK. You want to you want to consume them from like X slash TX. Yeah. So okay, minor release. Let's, okay. Let's say we call it a minor release. Great. But um, let's like the 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 consumer module that's consuming those types is XTX, and. But it's not just XTX. Like it's also it's also the SDK, the main SDK. And so, say you tag something there, um, and then you have two consumers. And say like say for instance, you're still working on XTX, and you just need those types for XTX. And then you decide, you know, what, actually, I messed up something. I need to go change it. So let me go change it. Um, but you've already tagged the release that you needed for. You know, you already tagged a release. Maybe a minor release, and that already got consumed by the SDK. So I, I don't. I don't have steps that are not up to date. Okay, so the problem is I've made a mistake, and now it's hard to change. Well, it's not. It's not a. Mis it's not just a mistake. It's like, like when when protofiles are in development. Like we had this discussion before, and like I and 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 it's you know I brought up oh may, okay maybe we should have a maybe we should make proto breaking a re a required check on main. And like people brought up good, you know, good rationale for not making proto breaking a required check on main, which is that like you can't actually know until you release something whether or not you've done the protofiles right. And saying like, well, because you made a mistake in um, one well, protocol, why can't why, you, why can't can't you know? Breaking. Why is it that's that just seems like an odd tactic? It's, why is it that you can't know that your changes are right until you? Because you need to actually use your API. You actually need to use your API. You actually need to, to test it out. Like you, you think that you, maybe you, um, like for instance, in the case of what happened with Auto CLI, it turns out we added a field that like we couldn't actually handle. Like that that field was not actually supported properly by our library, and so like having it there is kind so, of a mistake so why, why why couldn't that be surfaced? Like so, this is kind of I'm wondering if this is a feature of like how we do work. I mean. 
so like is it impossible to catch things before api module changes get released like why is it impossible or is because it just because is, is it just not, not something that we do i think it's just unrealistic like you're like it, it just goes against how like it goes against experience like that sort of it's not like in a theoretical world, maybe it's possible, but it goes against experience. Like the experience it doesn't see, see. That's that's why I'm confused. It doesn't go against my experience. I mean, I I feel like I feel like I'm pretty capable of like testing out changes that I'm making in a dependency. And everything everything is a sorry a dependent. Everything is a dependent of uh, everything depends on the okay. API module. So let, I mean, let, like, me you, let me give you another example. Okay. I mean, locally, like, like, okay. I think you're arguing, I think you're arguing for like being able to do it. Um, like actually being able to manage that workflow, but let me give you another argument that, that, that even stands when you, when you can do that properly. Okay. Um, you haven't actually released this, like you've made the changes to the protofiles. You don't actually have a server that implements it and maybe they're the correct, but you don't actually have an implementation. And then the clients get those protofiles and there's no server, there's no server that serves those up. And so now you've released something and it's and it looks like it's in production because other files are in that tag are in production, but this one thing that you've added isn't because you just didn't merge that PR before you made the tag. Um, I don't I don't know that it would look that way. I mean, that seems I mean, if you're working with bleeding edge releases, I mean I'm just thinking about I don't know. Yeah, right, like, can, releases, somebody else, like... can somebody else try to explain this? Because I feel like I'm 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 making an effort and I feel like it's worth like taking taking a few steps back and like um so so I think what Aaron's describing is like one issue um and it, it could be viewed as an issue and as, as a non-issue for depending on who's um, who's it, who it's being explained to. Um, it's kind of like the, the the core issue that is it has the potential to cause confusion with users. It's not like a end all be all type of thing, but it's more so that it could cause confusion um, with the idea of that. Like, let's say in in the, in our in our current workflow, how we do things is like like you described, Matt. Like we make a we um, separate the proto file uh, from the actual logic. Um, and this helps reduce the amount of changes so we can actually have a meaningful review. Um, and then let's say we merge that those proto files and let's say we call them V1 um, in this scenario or um, let's, let's use V1 as this example. And then we and then staking is ready to be released. So we rewrote staking. Um, now it's V2 staking and now we want to push like release staking. As part of the release process, we need to also release the API module that has the new um, staking proto files. And in doing so, we uh, unintentionally, not intentionally uh, release also the, um, or not release, release is a poor word, but push the buff, the changes that um, the V2 changes from off. Um, so, so this is kind of like, it has the potential to cause confusion with users. Um, it's not like an end all be all. And I think depending on who, who we talk to in the ecosystem, like right now we have like one view that um, says that it's like confusing. And then there's another view that says like, it's it's not as confusing as we may perceive. Um, and so that's I, that's where I think the like current um, conversation lays. Does that kind of like clear up some things? No, not, not, not really. I mean, I kind of like kind of knew all that. <laughs> Okay. Um, so, so, um, okay. Sorry about that. Um, so I think like um, one alternative, like what Ferdy suggested, is like uh, right now in the protofiles we have like v1 beta one, and the original reasoning behind like tagging v1 beta one is because we were unsure if those were the final types for those versions. Um, I, I'd say we were kind of at the point where we're kind of like reassured that those are like the types for um for those for like let's say the v1 version and what Ferdy suggested is like in the scenario that we push off proto files we don't actually tag it let's say v2 we say v2 alpha one and in our documentation for for using it uh, for using the api module we say um anything that is alpha or beta has does not have api guarantees and could be consensus breaking if integrated before the final release is out 
so that is like one alternative if we decide to like um and then this is basically saying like okay like like if you use it this is your fault the same way we say that if you use the alpha or beta tag of the cosmos sdk um we cannot guarantee that it is not consensus breaking up until RC and final release. Um, and I think this this could potentially solve most of our problems. Now, I do I do think like Julian had a different proposal of like moving the API module to be within the um, within the module instead of like outside. Um, that's another proposal. Um, and so I think these are like. Uh, all valid proposals and it's more so like what what do we feel most comfortable with um i guess yeah i think there's i, I think there's maybe some missing context here like we've actually like so like Amory's not in this call but like we've actually had a fair amount of fair amount of discussion with um simon from cosm js and like like there's certain things that we've we've discussed like in the context of another client generating code that like i think I'm like holding as, as sort of unworkable just based on on the problems that arise when you actually have a client. So like I think that's also another piece here, like that maybe is um like makes it seem like there's more option, like that some options are workable when like they probably are not gonna be a good I mean, yeah, I mean maybe we can say that that they're workable, but they won't they won't work well for clients. Um, so maybe I should, maybe it would be useful just to, to like talk about a few of the things that have like been discussed with like Cosm JS. Um, and yeah, in particular, so, hmm? so, so, so that, that is like one way. And I think that's like a good differentiator, um, that, uh, that may have been lacking context. Like one issue is like the actual users, like the application developers, and the other is, uh, clients, like the people who generate the proto files. Um, who generate like uh, Cosm JS generates a bunch of JS code for queries and transactions based off the proto files. Um, so 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 yeah, uh, um, we could we could potentially talk with them. I think like the um, I, I will say like Cosm JS has to be like reworked entirely, and I think like the current ending of Cosm JS is actually very poor, um, and so it, it's kind of like like it might be easier to talk to like Dan because he's doing a lot of the proto stuff and see how he's interpreting it um, on the client side, um, and I think like if we best communicate with him and like we he builds it into his um, compiler his generator um, that like anything that has beta beta one or alpha one. Um, or anything alpha beta that he just doesn't generate the types from, and then that would like avoid that could have that could have the potential to avoid the majority of client issues. Yeah, so if if I'm understanding this right, I mean, let me just say what I think y'all are saying, and you can tell me if I'm wrong. Is um, in order to solve this problem of early releasing a API module, the proposal is to tag releases with alpha or something or beta. But do, like doing so, you if we have one API module, you're blocking, you're kind of queuing up all changes. Like nothing can go out. It's an all or nothing release model, right? Oh, uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, sorry for not not providing enough context on that one. Um, so so like currently on the proto files, we actually like tag, we actually name the folders like v1 beta one instead of like tagging the proto files. And so it's like the API module would be like a global release every time there's like a V1 or V2 um, proto file, but like the intermediaries, the ones that are like um, in development would just be like V1 alpha one. Um, and so in this sense, like, yeah. it wouldn't, it wouldn't queue it, it wouldn't queue it up. Like we'd release it. Okay. We just tell people don't use this until you see, until the alpha or beta are gone. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, that sort of solves the problem from I, my perspective. It is annoying because you, you have to refactor upstream or downstream, rather. But uh, yeah, I, don't, I don't think that solves the problem. But like, I mean, I, I know why it seems, sounds appealing. Um, and I wish I like, I feel like this is something that we discussed already, like in, in a fair amount of depth. And I, I should probably look for the thread because I'm pretty sure there was a thread on this. 
Um, yeah, like one, you need to downstream. Like if you do this this folder separation thing, then what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to like rename your profiles, put them in a different folder, and then you need to like do that like right before you're actually going to tag a production release, and like you need to then basically update your your server implementation like right at the minute when you're going to do that release um and you still end up with this like it just ends up push, pushing a lot of complexity into the into like the setup and and the, also the other part is that like there is a reality that we we have and and probably will release certain things into production that are are tagged as alpha and beta so i guess i'm not understanding how any of this is actually solved by like what what is the alternative you're proposing to not needing to release i mean releasing like uh releasing two modules in lockstep is always you're always going to have these problems right and if we have an api module that's separate from bank whether it's a bank specific api or just a monolithic api you still have the problem of coordinating releases no um, yeah, I mean, you totally have the problem of coordinating re releases. Like, I just don't think it's, I don't think it's workable to have a single monolithic API module and separate Go modules for the state machines. Like, I think that you're, like, the, you you need, and there's, like, other problems that you're going to run so, into. Yeah, so why? Like, I still don't, I'm still not seeing the why. Like, why is that worse? Why is that, yeah, why is that worse than having a bank-specific API module that you need to coordinate releases with? I mean, there's other stuff that, like, got this, that, I talked about an ADR fifty four that goes into like actually from the perspective of like the state machines itself themselves. It's not like then you also have like um, like it, one thing the ADR fifty four is trying to deal with is like how do you deal with possibly having um, different matrices of dependencies between modules where you could have version two and three of one module working with version one and two of another module. Um, if you're if the if the dependency on all the generated profile buff is in the same API module, then you're never going to end up being able to have a combin like a the right combination. Um, you're always going to have a little like you're yeah, always true. Gonna have a drift between those I, two. Like it's just not. Would, yeah, yeah. I was sort of backing off of that. I mean, I, based on the last comment on ADR fifty four, it seemed to be saying like, "Oops, I just dropped my mouse." Uh, we're not. We're not doing any of that stuff. We're kind of just going to use uh, replace directives. Um, so doesn't it doesn't that kind of obviate the testing matrix uh, thing? No, it just makes it impossible. Like the replace directive. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I mean. <laughs> like it makes it impossible to have. Like basically, the the monolithic API module makes any kind of not any kind of. Um, version matrix impossible. Like it basically makes the whole. It, it basically defeats the whole purpose of separating things into separate Go modules. I, so do I mean? So do replace directives, in my opinion. I mean, maybe you can kind of. Uh, I don't know. No, no, not necessarily. Because if you have like if you have an API module scoped to a like a state a state machine module, then all you need to ensure is just that like your API module is the version the state machine module was built against. And if if the if the go build kind of um, resolver resolves a later version, then use a replace directive to pin it to the version that it was built against. That's like a relatively solvable problem. It might not be pretty, but it's solvable, whereas like it's actually unsolvable if you only have a single API module because there's no way to get the correct there's no way to get a combination that's different from the related. Yeah. Right? I mean, I know it's I know it's solvable. It it it's just it's a lot of manual dependency management that like maintainers have to do or people writing new modules have to work with. Um so, and, and how do you even like how do you even test that? I mean, it, it would I, I just what? So so the, so the, I I think the 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 issue we're kind of like describing here is like an issue related to like the monolith API module. I actually don't see anyone but us doing something like this. Um, I, I I see more people, um, potentially like regenerating their protos with Pulsar directly into the module itself, um, and not doing the API module. Um, I th I think the API module might be specific to us, um but and, and so this kind of like 
potentially talks about like one of the issues um and like it could be good to also talk about like once we get through like some of these issues are like an alternative to the monolith api module yeah, so i guess one alternative is we have an api module per module which I, I may, i'm kind of reacting against that i think because i just don't think we want an explosion of gun modules um and I, and the other, I mean maybe a better one is what you just said marco is like why don't we generate into the module module yeah I mean, we could, so let's go go through those. Like, I, I think I, I hear you're reacting against that, and I guess I thought that was was hoping that wasn't going to be so controversial. But I guess that, like, the explosion of Go module tags is is maybe a concern. Um, but, like, I think it does. You know, I think that my point, if you kind of follow it, if you think it through, like, there's no point. There's actually no point in having. Um, separate go modules if you have a monolithic api module so so like i i think like that's just one one counter to that like like i think like defending the monolithic api module is not really going to help us get much further with this i think like we can explore generating the protofiles directly in the module um like what we're doing now the thing that that defeats is semantic versioning like you can't do semantic versioning um, okay, I mean, I, I'm I'm not really convinced, but if I'm the only one who's unconvinced, I won't like push it anymore. So, uh, as far as monolithic API, so yeah, convinced of which part? Sorry, I'm not convinced that it that it, a monolithic API module is not worth defending. But if I'm the only one who's in that camp, I, I won't push it anymore but, but yeah. like what does it what does it mean like why would you like how would you deal with a situation where you tag a new release of a state machine and then you 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 want to you want to do two different versions of two different go modules but i think can... i think we were talking about uh v1 alpha one like package paths yeah but it's that's not that's not how we actually do things like we actually like like add new for instance add new queries to um an existing package in a non-breaking way, um, and once you do that, like you're you're basically adding. You don't actually have the right version at runtime that you built with. I'm, I'm not, yeah, I'm, so I'm not really following. I it, it, I can't understand. Yeah, I'm not following that what you just said. So I, I think what Aaron's saying is basically that um, in, in this scenario, so currently how we kind of like add things to protobuf files is like we add a query and we backport it and like it's there um if we were to if we were to what just happened um if we were to um, do like v1 in the api module and, and like backport a query then there is the potential that like someone uh, if the, if someone updates the API module dependency, but not let's say like the gov module dependency, then the, the their message their query server will have like a message will have a query that actually doesn't exist. Um, is that right, Aaron? Yeah, and it can be even worse than that. Like where, like okay, currently like this is the whole like the first point that ADR fifty four tries to address is like you have. Like there's some amount of state machine logic that actually gets pushed into the they generated code. Like, like there's a non-negligible amount of even if you don't like if we had validate basic, then there's there's definitely um, state machine breaking changes in the API module. Like, and that's like an open question whether or not we actually like allow defining validate basic on these API module types. And even if we don't define validate basic, like just simply adding a field to like a message for instance or adding a new message is a state machine breaking change um and if you're releasing like if you have if you have, no, have a scenario what what it seems like we've done something wrong if adding a message is uh, i don't know state machine breaking i mean if this is true like why are we using protobuf i mean adding messages to protobuf is like supposed to be that's the whole kind of point of it so like the, I mean not not so much uh, even adding a message, but adding a field is definitely state machine breaking. I guess I feel like that shouldn't be either. I mean, if that's the case, like we really shouldn't be separating API from the modules. 
like at all. Because like, why why would you have a case where you can have two things at separate versions that are breaking? Like if they're if they always need is to it, be in, wait, wait, in can sync. You, can you just take a deep a pause here for a second. Like, did, like I feel like there's maybe there's more context I need to give, and like I. Tr like I tried to give that in ADR fifty four. Like I, I hope people spent a little bit of time reading some of like the the context. Like the starting point of what ADR fifty four goes is to describing why that's a problem. Like maybe we just need to step back to like that starting point. Like yeah, when no, you're I, having, I, having, I think I've I think I've engaged with the PR pretty well. like I probably spent a lot of time reading it. Okay, so um, here's here's a scenario that's actually pretty realistic. Okay. You have a query. You add one field to the query, okay. And and you you have two. And this is a scenario where now we're using this intermodule communication, okay. So you I can send. I, one I, 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 query so I just one. I just it's just in the interest of time. Like I understand how a field can be breaking. What I'm saying is, why would we set up a situation where it can't like. Why not just gen if this is the case? Why don't why don't we generate the types into the API into the 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 module module, not the API module? Okay, so great, we can we can get into that like that discussion. Why don't that we seem that seems like if I have to choose between um, times two modules, and I can possibly break my module code by depending on the wrong version of API, why not just not use an API module? Right. Okay. The okay. The thing that that breaks is semantic versioning, and maybe that's maybe that's an acceptable breakage. Okay. Like maybe, like there is a scenario where we decide that like Go semantic versioning is bad, and we don't follow it. Um. But if you if you do use Go so semantic, why is it breaking? Why is it breaking semantic versioning then? If you have it in the module, because if you add the message. Then it's a feature, right? So. Right. And so then, if you like, but if you so if you're using Go semantic versioning and you generate the API code, like the protobuf generated types in the Go module, okay, you need to change the import path to say v2, v3. But we're not doing that same change for the protobuf types. Like, if you add a, if you add like just a single field to a query in bank v1 protofiles so the protofiles are bank v1 and if we're using semantic versioning for the bank module then and we're having a new state state machine version we would semantically need to say oh this is v2 or maybe we can say it's v1.1 i mean i don't it, like there's different ways we can approach semantic versioning but if there's any if we're actually following go semantic versioning any like api breakage that we might do to bank we have to bump it to v2 so that API breakage in, in, in the Golang API, not the protobuf API. So something we add in v2 and bank, we need to bump it to semantic version v2 for Go. We change the import path to v2. Now all the generated files that we have will be prefixed by v2. Um, and if you had a module that wants to depend on either v1 or v2 of the bank module and the generated types are in, are in now they're in v2, but you're importing v1, they're not the same generated types. You can't actually, you like, you're forced to upgrade to either the bank v2 or to not support v2 at the same time. Like you have a situation where you, if you use Go semantic versioning, you can't possibly have um, a dependency matrix between modules that isn't just like the latest version that they support. If that makes sense. Like so, like it it, it again gets to the point where it defeats the sort of defeats the purpose of having separate Go modules because then you you can't actually have a matrix of dependencies. Does that make sense? I think so. I mean, we had also talked about not like generating your own types. Or we, we talked about doing that. Like not so, generating so how would you do that? Yeah, again? yes, generating your own types. Sorry. Um like so if I wanna if I'm off and I want to communicate with bank, I generate the types. I don't depend on auth for its types. I just generate the types from a certain version of the proto spec in in off mm -hmm. right and so then if you do that then if you're doing it like just the way that the code generator works now like first of all we need to make a change that that will allow generating the same the same 
like currently the the protobuf registry will reject if you have the same protobuf type generated with two go types so we need to make a change to the code generator that would allow us to have two copies of the same prototype types and i was proposing maybe we generate those types if you want to have client types you generate those internally within your modules so that like they're not part of your public api you just you generate them internally we need to make that change to protobuf and then you definitely cannot use keepers at all um, because the keepers would actually um or if you have keepers they couldn't have any protobuf types in the keepers because you don't want to expose those because that would be expose this kind of eight those these types publicly and if you're using adr33 then you can't you actually need to do marshalling and on marshalling because you can't um like you can't just say oh my internal protobuf type is going to be now passed into the your handler but your handler is using a different generated type so we need to do on marshalling on marshalling at this at this uh adr33 boundary or we need to implement this like I propose like a zero copy encoding thing to avoid that, but that's like completely rewriting the protobuf code generator in a very different way. It just seems very complex, is what I'm saying. But but we could entertain that. Like that's one of the options in ADR 54. Yeah. So so I think like the the issue that we're describing, um, just like um, let's see if I understand this issue that we're kind of like discussing right now. We're basically saying like if we generate the proto files in the module we will run into an issue where uh, many versions of modules will not be compatible because like auth will not depend on like two versions of bank it will only be compatible with one version of bank and the alternative here is what what matt said um like you generate the proto files in bank instead of depending on auth is that correct yeah, that's one of the approaches in ADR 54. Yeah. Um, see, I, see, I didn't read it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, this. Like, the, 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 scary, the scary part for me is like, if we're like touching how the proto gets generated and stuff like that, because that increases the scope. Sorry, sorry for it. You can go to. Yeah, no, I, I, I was saying like, do we really need to like support the, like, uh, let's say auth needs like, sorry, bank needs to support different versions of auth. Like, do we really need this sort of measures? Because like, it seems to me that that's the actual crux of the 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 actual problem we are having, and it seems like it's gonna raise the maintain maintainers complexity like a lot and i'm wondering if uh, like we really need it or or want it at least right now yeah it's a good it, question it, so i would say it's like it's allowing the evolving the uh, evolvement um you know uh, it allows us to evolve into like a new paradigm but yeah may, maybe maybe your question is right that like is this new paradigm actually something that is needed or actually that's something that is wanted? I do think that like some people, like the, the issue kind of arises when it's like, let's say we release new staking. Um, technically we have to like release new distribution and new everything that depends on staking in this scenario. Um, and it would be kind of like we're coupling releases with other modules, which also, could could be a fine alternative. Um, I think kind of the the question the the issue kind of arises like let's say um, I mean the, the issue a lot of these issues that like we're running into now in my head kind of go away with semantic versioning because like like when we were doing the liquid staking stuff and we were going to replace the staking module, a lot of people were like, well, we want to use the old staking module. We want we don't want to use liquid staking. How would we do that? Then it was just kind of like, okay, like we can't really tell people that they need to now fork um, this old staking module to be able to use it. And so like the semantic versioning would have been like, okay, you can, you can import V1 staking, we will release V2 staking with liquid staking. And that's kind of like an alternative. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, like if we want like cross version compatibility, I mean, what is like, the worst case scenario is like everywhere we call 
let's say in distribution where it calls staking, we just have like a switch statement that says like V1 or V2 staking, which isn't that bad because it's like the maintenance burden is on us. Um, and the maintenance margin is like quite low, I would say, uh, the, the complexity is. Um, but yeah, that, that's a, I would say that's a good question. But you, you like the problem is like you can't actually do that. Um, at least with it, like by like you need to have a build. Like say for instance, you had v staking v one. Like it sounds like first of all, you're you're like saying that there is like a use case for having module matrices, like dependency matrices, and like. Like I think there's a use case just based on like what I've seen seen happening in the ecosystem the past several years. So like I I guess I, I I've I feel like I've seen it in the wild a number of times. So like that's why I'm assuming it's desirable. Um, but like in the scenario where you say that the way you solve it is you just have a switch statement like they that you're now you have distribution. Distribution will import both staking v1 and staking v2 go modules. But staking v1 and staking v2 have the have like both the generated types for staking, like that's actually going to be like a a runtime error for the um the protobuf registry, and like even more complex, like that we um like what we've been dealing with 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 this auto CLI stuff in the proto registry is like say for instance we do allow duplicate types in the protobuf registry, well how do you know which protobuf types you're actually using to like expose either to clients or for unknown field filtering because like unknown field filtering is actually like important to know hey is this should this should we reject things that have have fields that are only intended for liquid staking or not um yeah i don't know i mean i, I kind of just feel like ge versioning generated types is just a code smell um and like globally like what do you mean uh, uh, I, that to me, that's like the crux of the the complexity here. I mean, we're, we're, what do you mean by that, though? Well, because when, when we talk about protobuf, we're talking about a format for putting data into a binary format, and then we have this specification, which maybe can maybe should be versioned. I don't know, but I mean. I mean, yeah, it definitely should be version. It's just a question, like, where do we do it globally, or do we do it like per module? That's maybe that's maybe we can not worry about that. But I think that's kind of why I, I'm in favor of a module generating. It's, I mean, the generated types are just an artifact of Go. I mean, they're not they're really nothing to do with communication or data on disk or anything like that. And a lot of the problems we're having are like just Go import problems. So we're kind of just adding to the pile of Go problems that we have by um, not just saying, like, if, if a module wants to work with some data either from the network or from disk, um, it just generates types to do that. Right. OK, but but. So you're saying that the module will generate the types that needs to interact with the other modules, or that yeah, other... like yeah, I mean that's like to me that's like the best solution in AR54, and and everything else just kind of has so many other drawbacks. It's not worth it. But then, but that that has the drawback that you have to do marshalling and unmarshalling at the module boundary. I think that that's over. I think that's a problem I'd rather overcome than the other kinds of. Problems. I mean, is that just something that we? Yeah, that that seems easier to me than okay. dependency hell. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I guess that's that's feasible. It's it's a huge amount of work in terms of of code generator changes and um and and like module. It's like it's a huge refactor across the spectrum. Like it's it's basically like um you know Stargate all over again. You have to forgive me. I don't. I don't understand the it's, reference. It's basically, it's basically like doing the the migration of protobuf all over again, um, but like in, it's actually even more complex, I think, than the migration of protobuf in some ways. Um, okay, so, so was this option in the ADR like not? You weren't really considering it seriously, or no? I am. I'm. I'm considering the options all seriously. Like I and I'm. I'm like I'm trying to be. You know, I'm trying to like entertain whatever option. Um, I'm just saying that that's the complexity, and that's like, okay, my current like, 
you know, my current thinking just based on how the size of the team, how I see development moving is that that's probably going to be pretty hard. I mean, my current, you know, and what I've been advocating, I think most recently, like just to make it clear is I think the most, the easiest solution that is feasible in the short term is to just have one API module per state machine module. And that also means one buff registry module. So that every every module has its own independently diversioned, like independently tagged set of proto and go proto files and go types in a separate API module. And the way that we make sure that that compatibility works correctly is you just have a a pretty simple runtime check, which just looks at the Go debug build info and makes sure that you're using the right tagged API module for your state machine module. And you don't need to do any other code, gen you don't need to do any code generator changes or anything else. You just need to make sure that you're tagging the right minor version. And you can even have validate basic in your API module. And you're always using the protobuf files you built your state machine with. You're just doing a runtime check to make sure that's happening. I in my mind, that's the simplest, and it's actually pretty easy to implement. Like it's something that that would take us like a a week or two to implement. Like, which is mostly just like. You think it would take a week or two to break apart the API module? Yeah, it's just it's just a matter of you put Go mods in each of the folders. You don't need to do any refactoring. You just put a Go mod in each of the subfolders where you need to have a boundary. You just keep the same package layout. You just put some Go mods there. And then you need to have a, a runtime check, which is just basically something that is like a, a one function that takes the name of a, of a Go module in the, in the minor version and, and looks in the debug info. That's like a week or two of like work that's pretty straightforward, as opposed to like rewriting the protobuf code generator to figure out how and like rewriting all the modules to use ADR 33 and to use this and designing a zero copy encoding thing. Like that sounds great. That just sounds like it's a year of work. I want to, yeah, I wanted to add that. I think that the problem could be seen from like a different per per perspective. Mm -hmm. And we could say that, uh, how we treat proto versioning does not work well with how a state machine ver versioning works in the sense that like adding an extra field is not proto api breaking but it is state machine breaking yeah exactly yeah totally i mean that is that is something that which does not mean that like Proto is in itself wrong, but how we are versioning Proto does not fit well with how we need to like version the state machine. Yeah, what exactly. What proposes an alternative? Like, what will we do differently to avoid having issues with that? I th I think probably like from model perspective, we need like a clear boundary division between like business logic and. Uh, and the API, which is exposed to like other modules and, and, and clients, of course. And then my feeling, so like, let's say, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, like Auth uh, as a module, as, as in, in its business logic should, should be able to like handle both like uh, Auth v, v, v1 and Auth v2 API. And then my feeling is that every time we are making like a proto change, even if it sounds wrong and it, it sort of like defeats the purpose of, 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 of protobuf, but every change in proto should like cause like a version bump and different prototypes too. Yeah, that's something we explored. And I, I mean, I think that, you know, that maybe is worth re-exploring. Like we did, we had conversations with um, Simon, you know, from Confio regarding Cosm.js and doing that. Um, like, I think one reason why we, um, there were some reasons why we didn't do that. And and there's actually a, like a thread about that. I mean, I, I think maybe, you know, maybe, maybe we revisit that, that decision. But I think one particular thing that we found is like, we'd made a change to um, like the queries where we actually added, like we added a field to the pagination info in queries where we added the option to have to reverse the direction of pagination. 
And that resulted in basically a client, a new client feature for every single query. Um, and maybe that's like a rare case, and maybe that's not something we'll do very often, but like that case is one like where if we, the alternative to doing that would have ended up being we need to have pagination v2. And then for every single query that wants to support reverse pagination, we would have needed to have a v2 query where we copy everything, but just change the reference to the v2 pagination. And just that, that like one case in, in particular stood out to me as like, Oh, that's like a pretty, like if that if that if that is a, a scenario that that happens often, it's like a pretty bad consequence of that sort of design. Um, and I think there were other cases that we found that were just like, yeah, that this is going to be messy in other ways. But maybe you know, maybe maybe the benefits you know outweigh that complexity. It's just like, yeah. I have to run to the to, to start working group. Um... But I think we yeah, we could use like another call for this. So I mean, just accept this call to repeat. Um, I think we've made a lot of progress on like understanding the different aspects, and I'll try and um, put the transcription into a synopsis, and um, then we can see. Uh, and we can kind of like all think about it for. A few weeks, uh, a week, and then maybe if we come up with a different idea or someone has a different proposal. But I, I think right now we're this is already like a lot of more progress than we had a week ago. Yeah, sounds good. Next, uh, yeah, we should follow up in a week. I think. Cool. So we'll meet again next next Wednesday. Yeah, this, that sounds good. Um, thanks, everyone. Perfect. Thank you. So, See thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.